Cause not, you don't, you, you guys just don't work with anybody. You guys are rain factory. You guys make it <laughs> rain. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it looks something like this. What's up, everyone from BTS TV Media? I'm Frank Susi, and you're tuning in to the BTS Biz Podcast, where we go behind the scenes and interview business experts, and they reveal their knowledge to us. Today's episode is sponsored by. Finest City Entertainment, the finest in live event production and broadcast media. So for today's episode, we have the one, the only, Director of Product Marketing from Rain Factory, who's personally helped a ton of businesses raise millions of dollars through crowdfunding. Tess Estendarte, thank you for being on the show. Hi, Frank. Let <laughs> me repeat that. Hi, Frank. Thanks for having me here. Oh, definitely. So tell us about Rain Factory, the company you work for, and what you do for them. Rain Factory is a digital marketing agency based in both Oakland and Seattle. And as I said, digital marketing, we cover uh, all crowdfunding campaigns. Um, we also uh, manage and execute e and Amazon campaigns, as well as manage social media. Um, influencer outreach and public relations. Nice. And what what do you do for Rain Factory? Well, as a director of product marketing, I manage the product marketing team and basically shepherd, manage, and document and train and get us to uh, successful campaigns, whether it be uh, crowdfunding, e-com, or Amazon. So it sounds like you do everything for them. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I basically I basically serve as as I, I would probably, if there was one label to attach to it, is is being the process uh, guard, making sure that we have processes in place uh, to get us to where we all need to be, whether that be the team members at Rain Factory or the clients themselves, and making sure that we document that, we adhere to that, and uh, comes part and parcel of it is making sure that our our processes are, are looked at, reviewed, um, you know, whether or not we have to make pivots or changes or basically maintain them. Nice. I, I kind of want to go back a little bit and talk mm -hmm. about crowdfunding for the people who don't know. Can you just briefly explain what crowdfunding is? Crowdfunding, when people, when, when the, the name crowdfunding, uh, the platform names uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo come to mind. Um, both of them have been in the business for probably, I think, for more than 10 years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, crowdfunding essentially is a platform uh, where creators or business people, entrepreneurs, launch their products on these platforms. Um, it's their first foray into the market, as, at least for the product anyway, and it's a way uh, for the public to know first about the product, support the product in terms of the pledges, uh, and I can talk about what those pledges mean, and uh, the, then the manufacturer, the creator, then after successfully reaching funding goal, or hopefully so much more than that, they're given the ability to ship product out to the backers and collate feedback about the product, and hopefully that would best serve the creators or manufacturers in terms of any finessing with the product itself to get it ready for a full retail launch. What would you say the pros and cons are of doing crowdfunding versus trying to get investors and do it the traditional way? Well, um, people don't know this, but there are investors that are involved in, in crowdfunding campaigns. The, the, I think for me, the best value of crowdfunding is getting yourself in front of communities that generally support crowdfunding campaigns. Um, it's, not, it's not for the, your general market. Uh, the reason why I say that is because you basically are giving money to a creator for a product that you may not be able to see or touch or use for maybe a good three to six months. Some successful campaigns have gone beyond that. Um, the reason why, why creators should do this is then, you know, they can validate the market. If there is certainly a market, uh, the, the feedback from the market, sort of like the um, welcome that the market or the community gives to your product. And that usually is translated into how much money the campaign raises. Do you feel like there's certain types of products that work better in crowdfunding? I, I think it's pretty much broad brush. Um, 
what I've seen in my experience, you know, some, some products that come to us, we basically say, uh, we don't know if there's going to be a fit. But um, we've been proven wrong. We also, though, do recognize where certain products will generally not be a fit for crowdfunding. Uh, it, technology products, of course, um, less more uh, donation-based campaigns. There are other platforms for that, you know, for a specific uh, organization or mission that they may have. It generally has to be centered on products that people can put in their hands or plug to a wall you know, for, for power or put batteries in, um, et cetera. So, or uh, through recent experience, we've seen uh, the, the, um, the burst, basically, of um, e-bikes crowdfunding campaigns. Bunch of them. How many e-bike clients have you worked with so far? Um, I would say there was probably, me personally, I've worked on, on one. Uh, but I'm, I'm managing one currently, hoping to launch before the end of this year. But in general, crowdfunding, especially on Indiegogo, there have been, and this is probably as a result of the pandemic, and now people adjusting their commuting or their traveling routines. Uh, they say it's, it's the beginning of what they call micromobility, uh, where we stay away from cars. You know, cars are best reserved for long hauls or for you know, road trips. Uh, but essentially, if you're going from point A to B, uh, that basically maybe no more than five, 10 miles, uh, uh, it would better serve you, the person, and also in the environment to get on an e-bike. Yeah, so capitalizing on those trends, huge. Yes. But do you, do you feel like that it gets kind of annoying working with so many e-bikes? Like if you had like just another e-bike company after another e-bike company, do you feel like uh, we, we, we would kind of identify this as a client we don't want to work with, or are you guys willing to take any kind of client on? You know, surprisingly, e-bikes have just evolved. I mean, there's the surprising evolution of e-bikes. You know, before, I think the Condor campaign a number of years back, I think just, just led uh, the onslaught of e-bike campaigns. We've seen them now go, get, more, get more light, more powerful, um, more battery um, capabilities. Um, you know, where a single charge is about two to three hours, and then it can take you up to 75 miles. Um, and you could just easily charge your bike as easily as you would, um, you know, a hybrid car. Um, so I, I don't think there ever is going to be an end or a glut of e-bike campaigns, because what, what we've seen so far is e-bike, an e-bike manufacturer always has its merits. One could say it's foldable. You know, it's easy to take with you. You don't have to worry about it being stolen. The others don't focus on that. They focus more on power, um, where you basically can take it on, you know, on dirt roads and do all your little tricks. And, and that's, that's kind of funny. I was actually in a, a foldable e-bike commercial. You were? Yeah, just for a little bit. It went from being pickup shots to being the main star. Now I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it was fun, and these e-bikes are just, they're actually really cool, like, they can handle some terrain, it, 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 it I considered buying one. Um, Do you own one? I don't, but there, there is a, there is a company out there called Super 73 that makes some pretty yes. cool e-bikes that looks like uh -huh. motorcycles. Uh -huh. Were they crowdfunded? Were they originally uh, a crowdfunding? I don't remember Super 73. Right now, if, right now, as of today, this date, um, the biggest, the the, mo the top performing campaigns in, on Indiegogo are e-bike campaigns. Uh, the Baby Maker is it is the same one. thing on Kickstarter too. Um, I don't know so much about Kickstarter. Kickstarter, and I could talk about that a little bit, tends to focus on projects or want to promote projects that focus on public benefit, um, in the sense like, you know, books and music and film um, or anything that basically. Uh, affects the environment. Is, is that a requirement for Kickstarter? No. Or they just kind of tend to get those kind of like projects? They, they, they like those projects. They support, will support those projects. Um, uh, Kickstarter declared itself to be a public benefit corporation, a PBC, probably about a good two years ago. And, and since then, you could see from the platform their preferences uh, not so much for technology, but 
I would say more like innovative product design itself. Um, you know, your beds, your chairs, your um, uh, kitchen utensils, you know, basic things uh, that we use uh, that people have, you know, turned it a little bit into some twist, um, which we basically say, oh, I never thought about using it that way. <laughs> um, uh, Indiegogo is much more into um, e-bikes, I think, technology, batteries, chargers, phones, drones. Um, uh, yeah, we've seen we've seen a whole a whole gamut of, of really just the core of the product is having some sort of power source. Kickstarter versus Indiegogo differences. What should people be looking out for when starting a crowdfunding campaign and choosing between the two? I would say before you choose the platform. Um, you have to decide for yourself what your goal is to launch a crowdfunding campaign. Um, there are many reasons why people launch a crowdfunding campaign. One would be for, uh, like I said earlier, um, product recognition and also validation of the market. Uh, they also use it as a, a channel or as a way of a market study. You know, before you, you go ahead and launch the product, um, uh, through traditional retail channels, whether that be on your e-com site or Amazon, you would have this really, you know, maybe a small, uh, not a small, it could be small. When I say small, I'm thinking about 2,000 backers. It can go as big as 25,000. Uh, What's the most you've seen? I've seen probably about 28,000 backers. Um, but it does not mean, though, that the more backers you have, the more successful a campaign is. Um, before, before I go and talk about uh, the criteria for success, personally for me, uh, the one criteria to deem a crowdfunding campaign successful is not just to reach funding goal and to raise a lot of money, but also being able to get the product in backers' hands. Is a good video. Do you, do you ever find campaigns that don't have video that are very successful, or is it pretty much a requirement every campaign needs video? As studies have shown that campaigns with a video perform, will perform better. Um, for me, uh, I would take the position, if anyone would ask me, that you would need a video, that hands down. Um, some campaigns have done the homegrown video way, you know, shooting with their iPhones or... Do you feel like those work well enough? It really depends on the product. Okay. Um, the crowdfunding campaign really is not just about the product, but the story about your product and the people behind it. Um, and the video demonstrates the passion of the creator for the product, especially if the creator appears on camera. We highly recommend having the creator appear on camera. Those tend to do better because it builds trust and credibility with the community. But we do understand that there are certain people who are just camera phobic who are not, they deem themselves not to be telegenic or photogenic and say, I can't, I, and also I have a heavy accent, you know, uh, things like that. Um, but I've seen that, as I've recommended time and time again to anyone who's asked me about it, is like, be yourself. Be yourself in the video. Uh, don't try to be, you know, if you're, not, if you're not the big, bad entrepreneur leader of your company, don't try to portray yourself as that on the video. If you are, you know, some, if you are a person or a creator that everybody just thinks is, you know, the, the laugh of the party, then be that. Yeah, just be yourself. Yeah. So it sounds like you have some criteria for video. Yes. But when do you find that, hey, at Rain Factory, we want to outsource video? Is that often? Do you guys do video in-house as well? Or... Do you guys have your own criteria for video that you give to the video production team, or do you kind of have the video production team do all the work? Um, I would say that we work in partnership with the video production team. Uh, good videos uh, happen more that way when uh, Rain Factory is involved in the process. Uh, like I said, it's the story. Uh, you can't, I think that's a misnomer that people think about um, uh, crowdfunding campaign videos that it tends to be just like one big commercial. You know, here, here's blank. This is what it does. This is good for you. Uh, no, it's not. 
It's, it's, uh, it's not an infomercial. It's not a, a, a documentary. It <laughs> can't be that long. <laughs> um, <laughs> this uh, ebook. A video has to be between the mat. The sweet spot for, for a, a good crowdfunding video is two minutes. You need to be able to tell your story, convince people that your product is great, and also uh, build that trust in, in that person, the user, um, and, and make them believe at the end of it all. It's like, yeah, I believe in this product, and I think they will deliver. Those are all important to convey in a crowdfunding video. Do you guys repurpose that two-minute video and post it on social media as well? Sure. Or do sure. social media ads? Or do you just... Typically, where do these videos go? We When we work... On video, we'd like to think of the, the crowdfunding video as evergreen, that it can be used eventually on, on the company website when they fully go retail, um, when they open an e-com site. Um, also, uh, segments of that video are used in social media and advertising. So it's multi-purpose. Um, that's why it's critical that Rain Factory or, or an agency or the person or company that you're working with to produce your crowdfunding video should understand all of that. Get the most bang for your buck. Absolutely, why not? And you know, it's, it really is again, uh, an offset of why we, we think that crowdfunding video should be a story. It should be a, a storytelling video. It's almost, it can be also, it has to be persuasive, compelling, engaging, entertaining. Uh, the golden rule about crowdfunding videos is you need to be able to get someone's attention and sustain that attention for the first 10 seconds of any video. If you don't do that within the first 10 seconds, you possibly may have lost them. What's your favorite crowdfunding video that you've seen so far? Oh my goodness, my list of favorites. Top three. Is long. Um, I, there was one, I think, there was an e-bike campaign. Um, okay. It, was it more bike? It was juice bikes. I was in that one. Yeah, it was juice. <laughs> juice yeah, bikes? it's e-bikes. They're based was here. Was that the baby maker one? No, juice, bikes? Oh, juice okay. bikes. They're based here in Chula Vista. Ooh, SD. Yeah, yeah, SD. Uh, yeah, they they uh, shot it really well, and uh, I think what was what was really great about that video was because they had the, uh, Tora Harris, uh, the the creator, the CEO, you know, actually appearing on the video and using his voice for the voiceover. Um, he, they've been in business for 10 years. Everybody knows Tora. If you've bought a Juice Bikes before, you know who the person is behind it, and that's Tora Harris. And so he appeared on that video, and they did a pretty good job in terms of explaining how the product works. Um, I've, I've seen, you know, I've worked on almost, I, again, I can't uh, quote an exact number, but over 100 crowdfunding campaigns I've been involved in, um, managed, uh, worked on in one capacity or the other. And I've, I've seen so many videos. Um, did, you, did you enjoy working with that client specifically? Oh, Juice Bikes? Absolutely. Yeah. They were, they were, they were absolute pros. They, I, they knew what to do. They knew what they were doing. And I'm they sure you've launching. had your, your fair share of headache clients too. Shh. <laughs> what are some what, what are some I mean you don't have to mention them but what are like the actual clients but what are some red flags that when a client does this specifically or, the, or managing client expectations um, that's like ooh we should probably fire this client does that happen oh, it often? never gets to that point I think I think it just basically at the very onset you have to know before you take them on as a client why they're doing a crowdfunding video a uh, crowdfunding campaign excuse me <laughs> a crowdfunding campaign that has to be made crystal clear um, you cannot, one cannot go into crowdfunding and think that their primary goal is to make a lot of money. That would backfire. That would sabotage the campaign from the very beginning. That could be a, maybe a secondary goal, but not your primary goal. Um, your meaning the client. <laughs> so, so how do you tell that to the client? Like, hey, you know, the client comes to you, we're trying to make a million dollars. What do you tell them? How do you manage that? It's a really, it's a really, it's a, it's an often asked question. You know, how much do you want to raise? And everybody thinks I want to raise a million dollars. Now remember that the percentage of 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 campaigns that have raised over a million dollars is probably less than one percent. Oh wow. Yeah, of all crowdfunding campaigns launched, um, it's a it's a tall order. Um, it's it's we're not saying it's impossible. Everything's possible. 
Uh, but it really depends on the product. It really depends on everything that you see on a crowdfunding page. It's, it's, it's creative, it's content. Um, just as critical is pricing and also the team behind it. That's why we ask for the team to appear on the page, well, appear on the video, like the CEO, um, our spokesperson, but on the page, we ask them to relay, share their names and their bios. Okay. Um, people, people look at that. Earlier, you were talking about the pandemic a little bit and working remotely. How has that affected Rain Factor? Do you feel like it's more productive? Do you feel like it's less productive? Definitely not less productive. Okay. Um, you know, like the pandemic has affected all of us, um, you know, our lifestyles and our, our, our working lifestyle as well. Um, for the most part, we've adjusted really quite well to it. Um, what, what are some things y'all have like implemented to make it more efficiently working remotely? Well, I don't think we implemented anything different because mm. I was working remotely. I'm, I always work rem remotely for Ring Factory. I work out of my um, um, home here in San Diego and they're based out in Oakland and Seattle. Um, I would just have to commute regularly, uh, fly up or maybe once a month. Uh, I was doing that until before the pandemic. Um, after that, of course, travel has been restricted, um, but we do, we do have a corporate culture in Credo where uh, communications is important. It's not just maintaining that, but you have to be responsible in terms of making sure you express something and that people respond quickly as well. So it's almost, Oh, that's right, I didn't even hear it. Church bells. I think that was the, the 30 minutes, so I think we're good. So, so has anything actually changed for you know managing clients no. virtually? No? No, our okay. clients are all over the world. Um, so we basically adjust our, 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 our schedules and timelines um, in order to accommodate what's what works out best for the client for wherever time zone they are. And sorry, John a blank. <laughs> um, director of product marketing. That's that's a really big role. And um, I know project manager is kind of something that you. I'm trying. I'm trying to tie this together. So. Do you feel like the, the title of project manager is, fits what you do as the director of product marketing? Yes. Yes. So, so what does the title of project manager differ from director of product marketing? Are you more of a senior project manager and you have other project managers below you? Well, in a typical uh, corporate you know, uh, sorry, like layout, you, know, you would have your product marketing managers and then your senior product marketing managers and then, of course, the director and then... I have to report um, to the CEO or the COO. Um, I, I do think that project management has to be tied up the hip with product marketing because you're, you're, you're working with a client, at least for, for what we're doing anyway, from concept to launch, right? So it's like basically uh, like any other project, you're introducing or implementing something new. Um, and that's what we do here in the product marketing, um, uh, at least for Rain Factory and for other agencies. Uh, there may be other agencies that don't have a project management. Maybe it's more product marketing because uh, there are recurring tasks that have not changed. Like you basically, oh, we're going to work on content. We're going to work on manufacturing, uh, excuse me, on advertising. Um, Whereas with, with uh, marketing agencies, like, like I said, like Launch uh, like not Launch Boom, <laughs> sorry. Launch, launch Factory, <laughs> Rain Boom. <laughs> launch, <laughs> right. launch, I was gonna say Launch Factory. I was saving that question for later, but let's talk about it now. <laughs> our, our Rain Boom. No. <laughs> um, again, let me, let me rephrase that. Um, product marketing and project management for at least the niche that uh, the Rain Factory and other agencies are, 
it's, it's a given that it is a project because you're working on one specific product. Um, you know, you're basically introducing it to the market. Um, and, and project management, you know, for all, for all that rigmarole and all the complexities, you're, you know, it could be launching a product, it could be launching a process, um, you know, launching a new department. Um, with what we do, because it's all about the product, the product is, I, I would say that project management is, pro, for, for our piece of it, is product centric. It's okay. all about the product. Because that's your, your guys' niche. Right. Is product marketing. Exactly. So it's very niche to call it, you know, the director of product marketing versus the senior project manager. Correct. So it, the title fits the actual actions that you're doing. Um, how, does, how does one make their way up to the director position? Like, what advice would you give to young project managers trying to make their way up to that director of product marketing or senior project management position? Um, let, me, let me just go back a little bit in my life um, where I, I, I've been in the in business, basically. I've been working since I was you know, in, in company since I was 21 years old. I mean, really full-time job. Um, when I started, I, it was just, and I'm giving my age away here. It was the it was the start of cellular phones. <laughs> um, you can cut that out. Uh, it, well, uh, you know, not not the infancy of cellular phones, but it, at when it was just starting to be sort of like you know um, introduced to the market. What people knew about cellular phones when I started was it's this big lunchbox brick-like phone that's really heavy to carry around, right? You could kill someone with it, really. <laughs> um, how, um, how big are we talking about, like an actual brick? Uh, it, it's, it was pretty heavy. I mean, you know, I think it evolved from the walkie-talkies. You know, I don't know if you've seen or the, or the radios. What's a walkie-talkie? What's a walkie-talkie? <laughs> or the radio, like, like the military would use. Um, it looked like that. And what I've seen, when, anyway, I just wanted to go back there in terms of my, of how I went through that because the lesson I learned from that experience helped me here in my experience with Ring Factory. That is, um, I worked for that company for 12 years. It was, I started out as a customer service rep and when I left that company, I was vice president of operations and billing. Oh, wow. So. So you're just known for just outworking everybody, then. <laughs> and then just making your way to the top. So it, I thank you so much, Frank. Um, I think we have a position for you over here at BTS. <laughs> um, I, you know, in terms of in, in terms of how I think that helped me at Rain Factory, it wasn't it wasn't there wasn't a specific goal I had in mind. Like I had to be director of product marketing. No, I it was I think an innate sense of just doing what was right or doing what's right by the client, by the company, and having a really crystal clear vision of where we needed to be. Um, I basically just kept that all in mind. Um, and let me just also make sure that uh, for the, the young project managers out there, make sure that you work with your teammates really well. You cannot work in a vacuum. Uh, project management will not be successful without a great team behind you. Definitely. So you can know all the technical charting and scheduling and, you know, um, managing money, but you're saying like social skills are just as important, if not more important. Than they the are. It's, it's, to me, project management is essentially people management. people management. It's not just your team members, but also the clients and the other stakeholders, um, whether that be an investor or you know, I've deployed projects before in a company. It was actually, you know, other departments. Um, you know, in, it was it's still in the company, but it would be another division or another department. So what you would just have to make sure is that you can clearly communicate with everyone who's invested in the project, whether that be the client or the agency, um, and, and make sure you get them motivated, uh, make sure that they understand what needs to be done. And, um, and working with them. I, I, would, I would like to think that the draconian communication skills, if you have that, you will not, it will not. What is that, what is draconian? Like, 
I would I would say that there's a word for people like that where they basically are impossible to work with. Oh, okay. I like they base. I had a boss like that once where he, you know, said he basically said, "I need to get this done by tomorrow." Well, it's Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, and say, "I don't," you know, basically saying, "I don't care. I need to get it done by tomorrow." I, you know, there are other there are other names that come to mind to describe people like that. I I don't do well with people like that, and I certainly would like to think that that's far from my yeah, style. I'm sure approach. most people don't like working with those kind of people. Yeah. Well, there are some that I, I think thrive in that. Really. Uh, I've seen I've seen all kinds. Oh, really? But really, essentially, though, um, project management, you know, there are certifications for that, right? You get certifications. You can get... Do you think those are necessary? Like the PMP or Lean Six Sigma? It's a, it's, it's a good foundation. Um, just just to understand the methodology of, of project management. Uh, but after all of that, though, I certainly do believe that uh, communication skills are, are still paramount, like okay. the way you work with people. People management. Absolutely. So kind of coming back to the technical side of things of project management, how do you feel like, what kind of advice would you give to project managers who are stepping into a new industry they've never worked, you know, how do you be an effective manager project manager for an industry you've never worked for before? Just one word. Uh, well, actually. Hustle. <laughs> not, no, not hustle. <laughs> you have to put your head down and ask questions, learn. Learn how everything works. Learn the industry. Understand your market. Um, understand, of course, um, your corporate culture. Uh, but essentially, you just, I think, can't just go in and be like a bull in a china shop. You know, you have, you have to take plenty of notes. Uh, I always like people who, when they make an entrance, when they come in, they put their head down and ask a lot of questions. Ask for documentation. Ask to be tutored. Ask to shadow someone. Um, that's how I learned um, after that first company I worked with for 12 years, I worked, I left that company to join Sony Pictures Entertainment as the director of um, information technology client services. Moving up again. There yeah, she is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and Sony is a very big company. You know, it's got this huge, they occupy maybe like a, maybe two blocks in Culver City. Uh, yeah. And it, you could get easily overwhelmed and lost when you, when I, well, that's what I felt anyway when I started. Um, it's like, who do you talk to? How does this work? Um, how, you know, how, I mean, it, it, basically I could, I could write a book about my questions for my first day. But uh, what I did when I started was I introduced myself and, um, and worked for, you know, for about a month uh, with the people who were, reporting to me and the people that I had to work with. So you have to know these people, you have to listen to them, ask the questions, and understand how the world works, really. How, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's Sony or Rain Factory, um, you just have to understand how, how all that plays out. And then after a couple of weeks, you know, you, again, you can't just go gung-ho uh, you know, there, there are company objectives, right? We, essentially, it comes down from this, the, the big guy. Like, we have to make this much money this year and keep our, our cost to this amount. Now, that trickles down, of course, to all the divisional presidents. So, speaking of money, yeah. how do you deal with clients that are running out of money? How do you manage projects for clients that are like, hey, we're low on funds? Or um, I think we... You, there's a there's a good amount of pre-qualification or assessment before um, any client is onboarded. Uh, I think agencies have a moral obligation to say that, like, this is going to be your budget. This is how much you're going to need. This is how much you need to be prepared to allocate towards advertising. Uh, advertising is always your biggest expense for a uh, product marketing campaign. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure there's clients that you probably like are like, no, nah, we don't want to work with you. 
they have unrealistic expectations when it comes to advertising budgets or anything that just doesn't match up with the company culture from Rain Factory, how do you avoid working with clients you don't want to work with? You just straight up tell them, sorry, you're not a right fit. Mm -hmm. You kind of gently let them go and recommend them in a different direction. Look, it's almost like, I think professional or relationships, business relationships, almost work the same, you know, along the lines of, of personal relationships. You don't give up, right? Especially for someone that you value, uh, that you want in your life, you, you find ways and means to make it work. Um, you know, you listen to them, you know, like if you're having an issue with your friend or your spouse, you have to work it out. It basically is the same thing for, for business or for clients. You work it out and, and come to a place. Hopefully you may need some additional help, um, you know, support, uh, where you may have to get a peer or, your, or your, the person that you report to um, help you out with that in terms of uh, resolving problems with a client. Because there could be other issues. Sometimes it's not just costs. It's not- like, what, if, what about before you actually like, accept a client? and you know that they're not a right fit. How, do you guys mm. tell them that, hey, it's not a right fit? Cause not, you, don't, you, you guys just don't work with anybody. You guys are rain factor. You guys make it <laughs> rain, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> there has to be a criteria for that as well. Like, Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not privy to that process in terms of qualifying uh, people that, that, um, you know, that are interested in our services. Like you said, Frank, it's not just the product itself, but also the budget, um, you know, some some uh, folks may come up with these brilliant ideas, right? But then it may have the wrong expectations or misleading expectations that all it takes is ten thousand dollars to put together a crowdfunding campaign, including advertising. Um, that that's not that's that's not going to work. <laughs> uh-huh. I again, you have to set expectations. I think with with you know with anyone in the sales or business development process already has uh, the routine packed down. So, so how do you manage those client expectations during onboarding? Um, I think the only onboarding, um, you know, the only part where in onboarding where we basically set or reset client expectations is um, timelines. Timelines? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the only expectation I think that has to be made very clear is timeline. And uh, like any other project, you know, you have. And is it a strict timeline? Is it a flexible timeline? We would, you, you know, it's a reasonable that? one. It's a reasonable it's one. It's a reasonable one. No. What, what is an average timeline from like, from start to their goal? Like, oh, it like? could differ. I mean, at the minimum, you're looking at about eight weeks and, um, and it could be 12. It could be 16, uh, depending on, on where they are on, on the campaign. I. Uh, you know, like any other project, whether that be product marketing or any other implementation, there are always contingencies. Like if you don't finish this one, it doesn't get completed and the next one can't happen. There's a lot of that going on. Um, So we want, what we have to do as project managers is to make sure that you understand what's happening, have visibility on what can be fixed right away like maybe a client says, oh, I didn't know it had to be done that way. You know, uh, you basically said, well, video production, especially video production, which is always a big contingency, <laughs> which is, no, you will not have a video in one week. <laughs> it's, it's, it's four to six weeks typically for a video production. Mm-hmm. Well, now for a great video production company, maybe even four. <laughs> like but, this, you know, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, so you were talking about a great idea. You were talking about um, a budget of ten thousand dollars, which is probably not realistic. But what other elements, or what elements in general, you, can you b- briefly discuss that make a successful crowdfunding campaign? Um, I think the the most critical element is pricing. Is pricing? How you price your pledges will make or break your campaign. So. Um, what we always have to keep in mind, if this product launched today, would someone be willing to pay this blank amount of money for it? Very simple. It really is simple. How do you guys, how do, you guys do the research for, for pricing? 
Uh, Maybe that's a secret you don't want to tell. Yeah, us, but... there's 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 a lot of ways what to. What can you tell us? Yeah, well, there's a lot of ways to determine pricing. I mean, like what you would do if you were going to buy an e-bike. I would go on offer up, see how much yeah. your bikes are selling for. <laughs> yeah. What would you do? I would like, I would compare prices. You would compare prices, right? Definitely. I mean, compare features. There really is no secret. I mean, you would compare. You would do. You would go out and 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 find first if there is a, a product close to or equal to it. And if you do, how much does it cost? Um, and then, I, I think people also forget this, but product reviews are so important. Product reviews, especially if you go to the store site, whether that be on their e-com or, or even on social media, for instance, you can pick up a lot of nuggets about a product um, from, their, from their social media. I love nuggets. Yeah, it's like this product. This product is awful. What you want to find is this. What you want to find, personally, what I want to find is competitor product and their social media pages or advertising or even on their product review says, this I love. That, okay. Those are the kind of reviews I, I look for because then it tells me what are they doing right. Definitely. And then you can kind of dive deeper. Yes. And then you can kind of hack it and use it for your own thing and make it better. Right. So... Do you use any of those products yourself? Are there any products that you're like, oh, I like this, I'm going to use it, that you use today? Uh, from crowdfunding campaigns? Yeah, from clients you yeah, have. Yeah, yeah. Which, which, uh, which products? Um, I, have, I have the Crazy Baby, the Crazy Air, though. The, um, what is that? Uh, <laughs> they're earbuds or earphones. Uh, I think they, they, ra they raised millions, I think, from their campaign maybe three years ago. How, how does it work? And how often do you well, use I wasn't it? part of. I wasn't really part of that campaign. But from what I know, it it it's really it's a really cute case. It looks like a big capsule, <laughs> and and you, it, I I believe it started the whole the whole um, movement towards getting really cool aesthetic pleasing cases for your earbuds. Before it used to be like a little, you know, just plug it in there and that's it. This was a, I wish I had brought it with me. It, it was um, red, it's red. You basically slide it out. You put the, you put your earbuds in and then boom. So you walk around, you can basically hold it in your hand. It fits in your purse um, and it looks really cool. Um, you know, there've been many other um, uh, ear pods or not ear pods, I would, I would call them earphones. Are they like AirPods? No, um, Air, AirPods are a, gener, you know, a generation of product just by itself. But I think it started the, the whole innovation bent in terms of AirPods or earphones or earbuds being not just functional, but uh, aesthetically pleasing. Basically the whole cool factor with, with buds or earphones that you use. Do you use it every day? No, no, no. But I mean, you know, I still have it with me. Uh, there's been a couple. There's plenty of products. You know, we we work with so many. It's um, it's hard to fit everything in your life. Um, I um, yeah. I mean, once you once you understand how our product works, I guess you know you just you just basically go, oh, that's great. But you don't necessarily won't necessarily think that it would be using it in your life actively okay so just a few more questions and sure. i promise we'll wrap it up sure if you were the ceo of rain factory for a day what would you do oh my goodness i i cannot answer that question <laughs> you, you could have asked me maybe if i was ceo of the company where i started um i could have maybe have helped you there more <laughs> yeah Okay, yeah. what, would you, what would you do if you're the CEO of the old company? Oh, the CEO of that old company? Um, right back. Huh? No, nothing. Oh, <laughs> uh, I think, I think I, if, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? Um, and knowing the lessons now after I left the company and I, it, the company got, uh, was purchased by another company, you know, the whole, you know, cellular was just so busy and now, you know, it's evolved into wireless and all of that, but... I think if, if, you know, the CEO at that time should, or I would have counseled or advised him to stick to what works. You know, growth, 
Growers always will ask for a sacrifice, whether that be revenue or your corporate culture. Like, there will be something lost when you grow a company. Uh, the challenge is always to sustain that. You know, whatever you had before, before you were really big, um, that's the challenge, right? As you as you grow, like when I when I started, there was only th there were only three of us in the office, and when I left that company, there were close to about eighty people. Wow! So just do it works. Pretty simple. Well, it's not as easy as it as it seems because you're dealing now with hierarchies and teams and a closer look at budgets and and costs and uh, personalities, and not to mention you get an infusion of capital and your um, or the CEO uh, or the partners for that company are responsible for accounting for where that capital went, how it was invested, and what the return on that was. Do you ever feel like you see inconsistencies or, or problems within those things that you're like, oh, I, I have a solution for that, or I have an idea that I could solve that? Do you ever like have any inventions that you want to do? Oh, like like some a product that I would crowdfund? That you'd crowdfund, or maybe something in the you know, in the crowdfunding space that you're like, oh, we could do this better. I want to invent a software that could, you know, help us do this process better. Oh, um, okay, I think, that, I think the question was twofold. Was, the, yeah, yeah, yeah two-pronged. So basically, uh, in terms of a, a crowdfunding campaign, yeah, I have plenty of ideas. I have plenty of ideas. Um, Would you like to share one? <laughs> I don't have yeah, them Yeah, okay, you don't have to, you don't have to. I don't have That's them fine. with me. Fair enough, they're too good to but, share. But, you know, I, you basically, what I would advise uh, people when you crowdfund is you, you came up with a product to solve a problem. Not because you thought it was like, this is going to make a lot of money. No, you basically experienced the problem and you thought of the solution and you were so passionate about it that you drew up the plans and the specs and, and, and got it through the first line of, of getting a prototype done. That takes a lot, you know? Like, taking a concept and seeing it to almost fruition, where you have a prototype that you can video with, that you can take pictures with, uh, that people can write about. Um, that, I don't have that. Like, that, that requires a lot of laser focus and commitment. I, I do have that, but not for not 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 for that specific uh, goal. Uh, so uh, I again, you know, crowdfunding campaigns are are just be very careful about about your product uh, and be sure you're in it for the long haul. Now, in terms of processes, of course, there's always there's always innovations or pivots or things that you can always change because you know, like if you're in a position where you oversee people, uh, it just gets more, much more... Uh, complex. Uh, no, it, yeah, true. Yeah, Frank, it, it gets more complex, but it also is just so much clear because you, you take the perspective of, of not being in, you know, actually doing the work, but you can, you can see everything from a, from a vantage point where, aha, I know why we need to improve on this. Let's make a change where may, it could be as simple as putting a new field in the onboarding questionnaire. It could be as simple as when, when you're onboarding a customer or a client, you ask this specific question. Um, it doesn't have to be grandiose. It doesn't have to be where, okay, we need to have a big meeting to talk about this. You know, <laughs> it could be the, the little things um, but, the, you know, certainly there are fundamental changes to processes that are required, and I think to define that would be what impacts the other departments. That's really good, because I feel like people always want to come up with that grand idea, but it's the little things that add up, it's the little things that matter. Oh, the little wins are always, like, ultimately what turn out to be the big wins. It's, yeah. I think we should wrap up with that. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for being on the show, Tess. Um, oh, you're where very can welcome. The viewers connect with you or with Rain Factory? Oh, uh, they can always um, go to our site, which is rainfactory.com. Uh, we have, you know, we have uh, a way for you to be able to connect with someone instantly. You know, a little messenger uh, bot comes up. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, and also if you're looking into crowdfunding and, and looking to work with a, the top agency in crowdfunding, uh, there is a, you can contact, there are people that are listed in our contact form on the site, uh, 
We just ask that you fill it out properly uh, and correctly. Uh, but we, we really look forward to working with innovators. Awesome. Do you have any closing remarks, Tess? Uh, product, product marketing is, is evolving. Nothing is ever static. Uh, what you or anyone that wants to be successful in this, in this space has to have the ability or the inclination to want to learn. You need to learn. You have to be open to learning. You want to be able to um, just understand how something works. And you know, it could be Facebook, it could be Instagram, it could be Twitter, it could be TikTok. All these things happen every day. Changes happen every day. So be innovative, be flexible, be patient, and, and do your work, uh, do your homework. Just take plenty of notes and ask the right questions. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me here, Frank. Thank you, Tess. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the BTS Biz Podcast. I'm your host, Frank Susi. Don't forget to follow us on social media, and we'll see you on the next episode. Well, I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. see, see. It, it looks something like this.